It seems that many of you are having trouble getting your donors to fulfill their financial commitments. I did too for the longest time, but then I learned the keys to success and increased my fulfillment rate from 61 to 92%. I cracked the code and you can too. Watch this video to find out how I did it. The year 1983 was an exciting time for our organization as 18,000 college students descended on Kansas City for what we called KC83. Prior to that year, our organization had regional training conferences for groups of college students all throughout the U.S. right around Christmas and New Year. Each individual conference averaged between 2,000 and 3,000 students, but it was the brainchild of our founder to bring together under one roof all the college students involved in our movement and collaborate for a unique once-in-a-lifetime gathering. Featured speakers included Ronald Reagan, the Reverend Billy Graham, Josh McDowell, and a wide variety of other well-known speakers. The event highlighted training in life and success principles, but also included major activities including service projects and or outreaches into the local community, even though the temperatures that week reached record lows. We used dozens of buses to transport students throughout Kansas City. I can still recall my bus captain's mustache being frozen solid. One of the major highlights that week was a giving opportunity that we presented to all the students and staff in attendance in hopes of teaching the importance of good stewardship. The giving opportunity featured a new strategy at the time, a film developed on the life of Jesus taken out of the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. Students were excited to give to help get this new endeavor off the ground. One million dollars was committed that night. It was a record one night commitment for our organization would probably be the equivalent of about 10 million in today's dollars. The excitement reached a fever pitch as that amount was shown on the massive jumbo screens. To be part of a monumental event like that and an equally monumental giving opportunity made us all feel like we were part of making history. One year later, I got the results of the fulfillment on those commitments and my heart sank. Just shy of 50% of those commitments were ever fulfilled, $500,000. Don't get me wrong, 500000 was not an insignificant amount, but it wasn't monumental and would not have the impact that the film's marketing and distribution so desperately needed. As with many events, people got caught up in a wave of emotion that swept over the crowd during that event. In the days, weeks, and months that followed, students realized that the amount they committed was nowhere near possible. Apathy set in, and they either ignored the amount or gave significantly less. But also, we as an organization dropped the ball on what I refer to as follow-up. I've learned a lot of lessons since then and from events like that and have developed a handful of proven strategies that I now use to increase fulfillment of commitments, and I'd like to share those with you right now. Step number one, recognize the gift and commitment. All too often, attendees at fundraising events get caught up in the emotion of the moment as mentioned with the previous event. They make commitments beyond their means, but oftentimes, even if the commitments are attainable, people write down an amount on a card or envelope that night and forget about that commitment and then never fulfill the commitment. First thing I do is send people a letter, yes, old-fashioned snail mail, to everyone who attended. I have five versions of a letter that's designed to thank people and remind them of any commitment they may have made. The five versions include, number one, a thank you for your gift tonight, cash, check, or credit card. Number two, a thank you for your commitment over time, annual, quarterly, or monthly. Third, a thank you for your cash gift and your commitment. Fourth, a thank you for coming, even if they didn't give anything. And then fifth, Thank you for registering and sorry you were unable to attend. Those letters go out within 24 hours after the event. I like the phrase, out the door in 24 hours, that is. Some nonprofits have shifted to email thank yous, and I have not seen the same positive feedback on that form of communication as I have from a hard copy letter. It could be a generational thing that will shift as younger donors start giving most of the donations in the world, but currently hard copy letters are still the desired form of response. 
Getting quick recognition of a gift or commitment is unique in this world and sets you apart from most organizations, but also gets fulfillment of those gifts quicker, which helps with cash flow. And often, people are still basking in the glow of the dinner and may send a second gift because they were happy with the evening and outcome. Unfortunately, the all-too-common practice is to recognize people's gift or commitment days or weeks after the event or not at all. It's hard for people to be recognized or reminded if they don't receive any document from you. Step number two, call the critical few. Just as with thank you letter, a thank you call immediately following the dinner is most desirable. In fact, I've found that a call the next day, if the dinner was on a Friday or a weekday, or on a Sunday afternoon, if the dinner was on a Saturday, is received with such shock and appreciation that it gets people's attention and makes a positive impact. The typical response from the donor is, wow, I thought you'd be in bed resting after a remarkable dinner. But your attention to their gift and quick recognition sets your event and your organization apart from so many others. And with many events to choose from, your event will have that edge next time the person's invited. I always recommend contacting the critical few, those 20% that give 80% of the gifts or commitments at the dinner. And I count monthly commitments as well as single gifts or commitments. For example, $100 a month equals the same as a single gift of $1,200. The content of the call includes thank you for your gift or your commitment, a brief discussion on how the gift will most likely be used, and the desired outcome, if both are possible. I then ask, how did you enjoy the evening? Rarely do I get someone who didn't love the time. With some exceptionally large gifts, I even request to meet with the person for a meal or coffee and discuss the same topics. Step number three, remind regularly. Years ago, I heard a story about a couple who attended a dinner of a nonprofit organization. The next morning, the couple set sail on a cruise ship to the Bahamas. Unfortunately, they, that ship started taking on water about two days into the cruise, and all the crew and guests had to abandon ship. The couple washed up on a desert island all alone. The first day, the wife spent the entire time making a fire and seeking ways to be rescued. Her husband, on the other hand, just laid around under a palm tree doing nothing. By the end of the day, the wife, frustrated, asked the husband why he wasn't doing anything to be rescued. To which the husband responded, well, you know, we went to that dinner for that nonprofit the other night. I made a large commitment. <laughs> They'll find us. Well, even though that story always invokes a laugh, there is some truth to it. Reminding people of their commitment has proven to be successful immediately following an event. But also, it's true that frequent reminders have also proven fruitful. Some nonprofits have relied on receipts as the reminder for donors to send a gift. This is often referred to as a receipt-driven gift. But unfortunately, this only works if someone sends in a gift. If the donor doesn't send a first gift or has a gap in between gifts or simply forgets once, the receipt with the remittance slip is never received, thus stopping the flow of gifts. I've found that it's best to send reminders each month whether a gift was received the prior month or not. This would be in addition to a receipt and remittance slip. If done correctly, donors really appreciate this reminder. Now, this communication should not be perceived as a bill from the electric company, but as a gentle reminder of a commitment that was made. You'll want to include in this reminder a quick thank you for your commitment, a story of a life that was changed by the organization, and a reminder that their gift will have a similar impact on a life. Then close with a note that their gift will be greatly appreciated. My reminder is usually printed on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper with three quarters of the page being the letter just mentioned and the final quarter being a tear-off remittance slip with the amount of the commitment. On the slip is the whole amount if it was a single gift commitment or the monthly amount if it was a monthly commitment. I list each time it's sent. If the commitment is fulfilled any time during the 12-month period, I recommend continuing to send the reminder to highlight the successes of the entire year. Remember, this will include change life stories, but make sure that instead of listing the commitment amount as in the past, that you type the words fulfilled in the giving line so that the donor doesn't think that you messed up. You'll be surprised how many donors continue to send in second and third gifts because the letters are so encouraging. Step number four, reference any delinquent commitments. There are times when it's important to reach out to people who are delinquent in fulfilling their commitment. The first time this could be done is when someone made a monthly commitment and doesn't start that commitment. It's important to jump on it quickly. 
You don't want two to three months to lapse before reaching out to them and miss those months of giving. In reality, you'll know after the first month whether they're delinquent. I'd wait until about the fourth day of the second month to reach out to see if everything's okay. You could send a letter or email, but frankly, for a monthly commitment, a call is most appropriate. The next time to reach out is if they miss a month along the monthly continuum. Once again, don't make the mistake of letting multiple months lapse before contacting them. Sometimes people don't even know that they've missed a month. The final time that a delinquent reminder is necessary is one month before your next event, typically 11 months later. If the person still has not fulfilled their commitment, now's a great time to reach out to them. The content of the communication includes notification that the next event is coming up and that we'd like to have all commitments fulfilled before starting a new round of commitments. This really is a great time to tie off any remaining commitments. These four steps aren't the only ways to see commitments fulfilled. Meetings and visits and cards and notes are also very effective. But over the years, using the four steps I highlighted, recognize, call, remind, and reference, I've seen my fulfillment rate go from 61 to 92%. That's a significant jump and you can see that happen as well. Incorporate these steps into your event strategy and see your income soar. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, hit the like button and add a comment below. If you've used some of these recommendations to see commitments fulfilled and how they worked for you, or if you do these, how'd that work for you? Hey, I could use your help with something. As a fun exercise to let me know you got this far in the video, type the word fulfill in the comments section. If you're interested in joining me and making a positive impact on our world and even for eternity, please hit the subscribe button and click the all bell to be notified when the next video is released. If you want to find out what to do and say during a presentation, watch this video and raise more money than ever before. I wish you the best as you strive to increase your income and reach the goal of becoming fully funded. Thanks a lot. We'll see you in the next video.